Uh, so firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to present our work. Uh, today, I'll tell you a story about how we use the TCGA data to understand the role of uh, a common but not, but not well understood mutation in acute myeloid leukemia. Thank you. Uh, first, a little bit of background um, on the disease. As many of you might be aware, acute myeloid leukemia is a disease characterized by accumulation of myeloid precursor cells in the bone marrow that, uh, that are blocked in their ability to differentiate into mature blood cells. And like many other cancers, AML is associated with widespread deregulation of DNA methylation. So some work done early in 2010 comparing leukemic blasts to, uh, to normal CD34 uh, cells showed uh, both regions of aberrant hypermethylation in the red here as well as hypomethylation. Uh, and so what was most interesting for us was to see uh, what was the source of this uh, aberrant methylation. There are several reasons. Uh, it could be stochastic, as has been shown, cancer methyl methyloms have been shown to be quite stochastic. Uh, it could be a cell of origin issue where the methylation pattern that you're seeing is a result of uh, this, the cell from which the leukemia originated, or it could be a genetic mutation um, uh, so it could be a, a mutation that's actually driving aberrant methylation. So we were particularly interested in this question because uh, mutations in uh, DNA methylation mach machinery have, had been identified um, in AML, but at the same time, those, uh, those mutations could not explain all of the methylated, aberrantly methylated samples, so we would actually have hypermethylated samples that didn't have mutations in any one of these genes, uh, as well as uh, aberrantly hypomethylated samples. So we sort of, uh, because, uh, because of the availability of data from the TCGA with both mutation and methylation data for the same samples, we set out to systematically analyze this question, and we had two goals in mind. One was to see if we could identify any new genetic drivers of uh, aberrant methylation, and uh, secondly, uh, if uh, we could actually use the methylation pattern to find leads for a mutation-specific therapy. So to get to question one, um, I, we used a tool that was um, developed by my PI's uh, group several years ago. It's called Boolean Implications, and this was inspired by uh, Boolean logic where an implication um, actually is a pairwise operation. So in the context of data analysis, this enables us to look at pairs of, uh, at, uh, pairs of uh, attributes and look at their relationships. Um, so it was developed for gene expression data, and uh, when I started analyzing the TCGA data, I actually extended it to uh, consider mutations, copy number alterations, and DNA methylation. So what does it look like? It's actually an L-shaped relationship. Uh, if you look at the scatter plots of the attributes, um, so visually it looks like an L-shaped relationship, but of course we have a mathematical way of uh, extracting these relationships. Um, so the first step uh, to extract a Boolean implication would be to discretize the data. So again, we have a systematic algorithm that looks at the distribution of values for each attribute to come up with an attribute-specific um, threshold uh, of when to decide that the sample has high values or low values. And for it to be a Boolean implication, when you look at the four, uh, uh, four quadrants um, in a pairwise plot, you need to have at least one, you need to have one sparse quadrant. And by sparsity, I mean that there should be there should be very few samples uh, within that quadrant. And again, uh, there is a statistical test we have to actually identify sparsity. So as you can imagine, there are four different quadrants, and so you would see, uh, you would have four different types of Boolean implications. The one that I'm showing you over here is, is what we call a high-high implication. So this says that if A is high, then B is high. So another way of thinking about it is, um, what this is saying is, all samples that have attribute A high would, would almost, almost always have attribute B high, but the reverse is not true. So you would have many samples where attribute B is high, but attribute A is not high. So as you can see, it's a way to derive, to derive asymmetrical relationships. Um, so the next, um, the, the second implication, um, kind of implication is a high-low implication. In that case, you're actually looking for sparsity in this top quadrant over here. 
And what the high-low implication states that if A is high, then B is low. And that's typically what, uh, what is known, known as mutual exclusion in this community. I'm not going to talk about the two other types of implications because that's not necessary for this analysis. So what does our computational pipeline look like? So we took uh, all the TCG AML samples that had overlapping mutation and methylation data, and that's about 191 samples. Then with the mutation data, we identified um, 17 recurrent mutations. So these are, these are mutations that occurred in five or more samples. Uh, with the methylation data, we used the 450K arrays, which, so there are, four, there are 450,000 sites. We did some filtering to remove uh, uh, probes that had low dynamic range, and uh, then we discretized the methylation values. So now I have Boolean data on both sides. The mutation data is Boolean to begin with. I have Boolean, I have sort of discretized the methylation data and then we generate these Boolean implications. And just to kind of reiterate what I said in the previous slide, so a Boolean implication between mutation and methylation looks something like this. This is a high, high implication. So what this is saying is if IDH2 is mutated, then CPG site A is always methylated. And this is a high, low implication. So what this is saying is if DNMT3A is mutated, CPG site B is, um, always, un is always not methylated or unmethylated. So once we have the Boolean implications, we just count the number of um, methylation high, high, and high, low implications. And when I, when I started this analysis, I wanted to see if we would really see any differences between the, um, between the different mutations. And uh, to our surprise, it actually fell into four nice uh, categories. So the category on the right over here, so these are mutations uh, that have very few um, Im implications with methylation, both high, high, and high, low. So you can see KRAS and NRAS fall into these, which sort of make sense because um, they are not known to be associated with methylation. Then in the hypo category, so these are, uh, uh, these are mutations where um, you have many, many more high-low implications and high-high implications, suggesting that these have a predominantly hypomethylating effect. Again, DNMT3A falling into that makes sense because it's an inactivating mutation of, um, of um, a de novo DNA methyltransferase. Uh, so what was most exciting for us was this category of hypermethylation. Um, and um, again, what stood out was WT1, which is because it's a transcription factor, and we weren't really expecting to find it there. Um, so if you look at the data, again, visually, because uh, there's a whole bunch of numbers here, so what, I, what I've plotted here is the ratio of the number of high-high implications to high-low implications. Again, you see WT1 really kind of stands out. So that's what we decided to pursue further to see what, what was going on. Uh, so the first question was to see how um, um, the co-occurrence and mutual exclusion patterns of the three mutations in the hyper category, and what we found that, uh, was that both in the TCGA data as well as the separate cohort, the ECO cohort, we found that uh, the mutations were almost mutually exclusive. Um, and um, also when we look at the CPG sites uh, that are being methylated by the, th by the three different mutations or the genes that are associated with these CPG sites, we find only partial overlap or li little to partial overlap, actually. And so this is kind of suggesting that WT1 mutation uh, has a very unique um, hypermethylation signature, but it still does not tell us whether it's actually actively playing a role in causing the hypermethylation, or, or it's just some kind of epiphenomenon that we are observing, such as a cell of origin thing. So to get to that question, we decided we needed to really do wet lab experiments. Um, so um, we put a mutant form of the WT1 protein in, um, um, in AML, um, in, in THP1 cell lines, which is an AML cell line which, that is wild type for WT1. And then after 10 passages, we, design, we measured the methylome using 450K arrays, which if you remember is the same array that we use for the TCGA patients. And so this heat map over here, over here compares the controls um, to the WT1 mutants, and you can see an increase in DNA methylation um, going from the controls to the WT1 mutants. Um, and furthermore, what was interesting was I looked at the genes that were um, 
being methylated in the cell lines versus the genes that were being methylated in the TCGA patients with the WT1 mutation, and there's a very significant overlap, suggesting that um, probably a similar mechanism is happening in the patients as well. So now we have these genes, and so the next question is, you know, what, what are these genes that WT1 uh, mutation seems to be preferentially methylating? Um, so, oh, oh. so GSC analysis shows actually in both the, both the TCGA patients as well as the THP1 cell lines that they're extremely enriched for, um, for the PRC2 targets, so that these are genes with, with the H3K27 trimethylation marks. Um, and um, so, you know, so, I mean, it could, it's possible that this happens to any, all genes that are methylated would be enriched for PRC2 targets. So what we decided to do was to compare uh, the methylated genes associated with the different mutations and uh, to see if that was, uh, that was unique to WT1 and that turn, while, while you, do, you do see PRC2 enrichment for the other mutations, but the, the enrichment for WT1 is clearly off the charts. So just to give you a quick review on what the PRC2 complex is, it's known to be a master regulator of differentiation events um, throughout development, and it has three components, one of which is EZH2, uh, the catalytic component of which um, has histone methyl transferase activity, and it's supposed to induce the H3K27 mark, which is a known mark of um, uh, transcription repression. So is it possible that the WT1 mutation um, is actually causing dysregulation of PRC2 targets in um, AML? And our preliminary analysis suggests that that's indeed the case. So what we did is we isolated um, a bunch of genes. Uh, we call them the PRC2 marked genes in, a, in adult hematopoiesis, and we use the ENCODE data to, to come to that list. Um, and uh, when we compared gene expression from, uh, for the WT1 mutant AMLs versus normal hematopoietic populations, we found a significant degree of repression in the WT1 mutant AMLs compared to mature monocytes. And these were actually looking more like the normal progenitors, um, progenitor populations, uh, suggesting that, that WT1 mutation could be actually inducing um, a myeloid differentiation block. So to test this, um, we um, used a well-established cell line assay in which TF1 cells in the presence of EPO pr produced fetal hemoglobin, but when the mutant was introduced in the same cells, uh, they failed to produce uh, fetal he uh, hemoglobin, suggesting a differentiation block. Uh, so, so far I've come, hopefully I've shown you how um, the WT1 mutant seems to, be, seems to be producing both a dysregulation of PRC2 targets and also um, seems to be, uh, to be causing a differentiation block. So the next question from the clinical standpoint is can, can you actually rescue the differentiation block? So in order to test that, we used uh, a GSK126, which is, a, a, which is an inhibitor of EZH2 and is already in clinical trials. I believe for activating mutations um, of EZH2 in uh, diffuse cell lymphoma. And what we find is um, by treating with GSK126 um, for primary AML samples containing WT1 mutant AML, we see an upregulation of uh, mature myeloid markers. And this was not observed um, in AML samples that did not have the WT1 mutation, as well as in APML samples that did not have um, <coughs> that responded to, um, um, to, uh, to other treatments, but not to this particular treat treatment. So, so we are hoping that this actually means that um, EZH, uh, GSK-126 could actually be used as a targeted therapy for AML patients with the WT1 mutation. So this brings me to my last slide. Um, I've presented a story about how uh, we think uh, a mutation in WT1 is a novel driver of DNA methylation in AML, and we have actually tried to use the methylation pattern to come to, come to, a, cure, come to a potential therapy. 
so what's exciting from the clinical perspective is EZH2 inhibitors have activity in WT1 mutant AML. And just a little plug about the computational pipeline. Uh, the initial pipeline that analyzed mutation methylation data is not AML specific at all, and it should be applicable to other cancer types or even in a pan-cancer kind of analysis. So if there's interest in that, please uh, talk to me and I'd be happy to help you with that. So finally, I'd like to um, end with, with acknowledgments. Um, I'd like to thank all, all my co-authors on this work, and particularly Dan Thomas, who did uh, the experimental work, um, um, our funding sources, and finally the TCG, actually, for putting out this kind of data, because uh, that helped people like me with a pure computational background to, and an interest in biology to come out and try my tool on, the, on, um, on this kind of data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, a quick question, if I may. So I'm a little puzzled by your rescue experiment, because generally when uh, polycomb targets acquire abnormal DNA methylation, they lose the polycomb mark. And so I'm con a little uh, confused why your ECH2 inhibitor actually uh, rescues uh, the expression. So actually, yeah, so we, uh, sorry. we started out with the DNA methylation and then we noticed that the signal for this PRC2 dysregulation was actually stronger in the WT1 mutants. And that's why we decided to use these EH2 inhibitors. Um, so they're also. usually mutually exclusive. Right, that's what, yeah, that's what we had read in normal samples, but this is what we are seeing in the data. So we are actually analyzing it further to see what's going on. So how much do we know about the EPPR alpha? Because IDH mutation, basically, yes. and this um, is very clear. I have seen a pair up, um, so the original work, I believe, by Figaro, where they classified AML into 16 epigenetic clusters. One of the clusters actually had CBP alpha mutants, and they were, it was a hypermethylation cluster. But I do not believe that there's any work to actually validate that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Shabarna. And uh, we're going to take a coffee break now, and we'll be back for session four at 11 a.m. Thank you. <laughs>